Public Library Foundation, the sponsor of today's author talk, featuring Michael Togas. Um, thank you for coming. I'd also like to thank those of you who have made a donation to the Library Foundation's annual membership drive, which is currently underway. And I also encourage anyone who hasn't yet become a member to become a member of the Foundation by making a contribution in any amount you feel comfortable. We have some little forms available today. And um, we are a nonprofit, so your contribution is tax deductible to the full extent of the law. And um, your gifts help the Foundation to continue sponsorship of our wonderful programs. There's also a Save the Date form available today, listing our wonderful, exciting events for 2015. We have a full calendar of events. Um, it's up the back on the round table, both of these sheets. Um, the next event is the Foundation's annual meeting, and I invite all of you to attend that. Um, on the agenda will be election of offices, the budget, and the annual report. I now would like to introduce Helen Levesque, Foundation's treasurer, who's going to introduce today's author. One quick thing. I'm going to send around this clipboard. If I don't have your email on the Foundation's listserv and you'd like to be added, put your name and the email address. We can probably do that quietly. Um, now, Helen Lebeck, thank you. I'm Helen, I'm the Foundation Treasurer and also a Director. Um, I have to ask, although I don't want anyone to feel put upon or, you know, I'm not asking for ages, but does anyone actually remember February 18th, 1952? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Some of you will know. Yeah. No way. I believe so. It was. Um, you think you do? I think so. You must have been a young child at the time. And I'd like to say that I fished those grounds. Oh my. Uh, now, not particularly where the wreck is shown there, but down further on Marmoy, and uh, I think I saw part of the wreckage. Now, it wasn't much of it left. All that sand, sand, but uh, I, I think I do remember. And I had a friend of mine. I tried to get him here. And he was the Coast Guard, and he was assigned to Chatham about uh, six months after this happened. So he heard plenty of hours, and he, he he didn't come on it. He had to visit him the whole time, right? Now. And, uh, <coughs> Thank you for the, listening. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> when I come up to introduce our authors, I usually run through books that they've had published, awards that they have won, and I thought today a lot of you might have already known all about that. If you have the book, you write that flap. Um, so I did a little research and I thought I'm going to find little interesting tidbits about this particular book and about this particular author that maybe you don't know about. <laughs> and so from this point forward, I'm going to be plagiarizing crazily. But um, he, uh, Mr. Tugis, or Togus had an interview where he admitted that at the time he was researching this book, he was working in a corporate um, job, wasn't real happy with it, and would sneak out on his lunch breaks, dash to the Boston Public Library to read microfiche about the Pendleton disaster. And he would print articles from many cake papers as well as national ones, <laughs> ones that had first-hand accounts. Um, at the time, Casey Sherman, which you may have seen, um, he was here for an author talk uh, a couple years ago, I believe, um, was also doing research on this Pendleton disaster. And uh, Michael's name kept coming up, and so the two of them met over lunch, decided instead of um, competing with each other, they would work together, and that's how the book basically um, grew from that point forward. Um, Mr. Togus lectures frequently, and he just did one on leadership lessons from the finest hours for CEOs from the Gulf Coast. Um, how the crew of the CG36500 lifeboat under Weber's command pulled together. So it also has training implications, teamwork, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I think it sounds really interesting. 
Um, the original boat was found behind a National Seashore garage and restored by people um, like late Cape author Bill Quinn, and a replica is used in the film. So, um, and then of course I had to snoop on Facebook, because that's my favorite thing to do. And on Michael's Facebook page, he, got, he gets a lot of um, people suggesting ideas for books, offering information, and one gentleman by the name of Dick um, wrote, um, Hi Michael, just a note to inform you or the Disney people making the film of The Finest Hours that I have some 16 millimeter film of the survivors leaving the Chatham Coast Guard station to board a bus to head home. Also showing close up views of Pendleton Wreck shortly after. So it's Ooh. amazing, the people who come out of the woodwork and help and, and um, <laughs> you know, offer their, their information as well. So I thought you guys might be interested in those little tidbits. Um, Michael Thomas is the author of 18 books, including Fatal Forecast, An Incredible Two Tale of Disaster and Survival at Sea, um, A Storm Too Soon, A True Story of Disaster Survival and Incredible Rescue, um, Hours Until Dawn, The True Story of Heroism and Tragedy Aboard the Can Do During the Blizzard of 78. So as you can see, there's a, a slight theme to some of your books, but not all of them. He really offers a wide range of reading. So, on that note, help me welcome Michael Hogan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I was afraid she was going to read a passage from There's a Porcupine in My Outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> that, that book takes place when I was 22 years old and tried to live in the woods like a mountain man and failed miserably. Uh, before we get into the, the winter storm, I'd uh, like to pass around a, a sign-up sheet because every six months I do a newsletter and update people on the projects I'm working on. So here's one for the front of the room, and here's one for the back. Oh, a woman gave me a check. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the um, it, and in the the sign-up sheet, if anybody in the room is working on your own book project, in about two weeks I'm teaching a course with a publicist called Get Published. So it's not a writing course, but it's how to take your book idea and get a good publisher to, to put it out. So what we work on in the course is helping you write the perfect proposal, the pitch letter, and then what are the different options to publication. So if you're interested, you'll see a little box next to your name. If you check that box, I'll email you the, the information about the, uh, the course. Uh, the, there was an article in the Boston Globe about me, and they said, Togus is the master of disaster <laughs> stories. <laughs> I, like, I don't always do that. I do some fun books. And there's two books I recently did. They're very different. But the, the first is a fun book. It's called The Cringe Chronicles, and it's co-written by my daughter. And the subtitle is Mortifying Misadventures with My Dad. <laughs> and Kristen is now 27 years old, and we worked on this the last couple of years. But it's a look back at her teenage years growing up with an eccentric father and the terrible vacations we had. So if anybody's got a, it's meant for both teenagers, 20-somethings, or people that have teenagers. Um, so we, we tried to shoot for a broad audience. But what I found was I would read her chapters, do a little editing, and I'd be cracking up, but I'd also say to her, wait a minute, I remember, you know, part of it was your fault. So, she's, <laughs> so she said, how about if we do this? I write the chapters, you help me edit, and at the end of every chapter, there's just two pages for you called a dad's view. <laughs> So you get two different perspectives on the same incident. And then the other book uh, that, that's done well for young adults is uh, Derek's Gift. It's an inspiring story of, uh, I kind of call it like a cross between The Fault in Our Stars and Tuesdays with Maury. It's about a Massachusetts teenager and his battle with cancer, but the lessons he learned going through it. And every now and then I even pick up the book myself and just flip to a random page to get a little inspiration uh, and to learn not to take things for granted. But the, the new book that I'm working on now 
with a co-author is about a Massachusetts man when he was eight years old. He was on a, a ship in the Gulf Coast and he was attacked by a U-boat. And so what we're doing is his family was on this ship and it's a survival story of the family. But we've also traced the history of the U-boat commander. So the chapters alternate. One's from the U-boat commander's perspective. Uh, he sank many ships within sight of shore in the Gulf. I didn't even know U-boats made it to the Gulf in World War II. And then the other chapter flips to the family on the ship, what's happening, and then in the middle of the book, what happens when they, they come together. So that's the kind of thing I'll be, I'll be talking about in the next newsletter. So if we can turn the lights down, I'll leave some time at the end to take questions. Um, we're going to take you back to a cold day in February. And the, the gentleman who said he believed he saw part of the wreckage of the Pendleton, it was there for many years, and it, it was finally swept away by the blizzard of 1978. So you did, you did see it. Uh, let's see, are the lights great? I'm sorry. So here's the, the two locations of both vessels. Now, Disney's doing a, a movie based on the book, and I think they made the, the right decision to focus on one of these oil tankers, and they're focusing on the Pendleton. In a movie, having two would be too confusing. But for an audience like this, where I have the time, we're going to discuss the, the whole story and the true story. So the Fort Mercer was here. The Pendleton was there. Waves hit them so big, they split right in half, right down the middle. And this is their drift rate. So you don't just have two rescues. You actually have four because there's four pieces floating. And men are on all four of these, these pieces. So we'll take it section by section. There's really these four individual rescues. And the bow section of the Fort Mercer was in tough shape. You could see the whole back half of the ship is gone. And the first casualties occurred when the, the men who were in the pilot house, water sweeping in, they had to get out of there. They ran along the catwalk to high ground and one was swept away by a wave. So right off the bat, boom, you've got uh, your first casualty. They did, on this ship, they did manage to send out an SOS um, because they heard the loud bang before the ship broke apart. On the other one that we'll get to in the second half of the program, the Pendleton, they never even get off uh, a May Day. And so the first thing the Coast Guard did was send out five young Coasties from Nantucket. That would have been the closest place to get to them. And you see how young they are. And they're lucky to be alive. They never even made it to the ship. It was a mistake to send them out that, that far out to sea. And what saved them was they found a light ship. And back then, a light ship was like a floating lighthouse. It was a Coast Guard vessel at anchor, and it would have the lights on to, to warn sailors against the shoals. So they found this in the storm and were able to get on board. That's, that's what saved their lives. So meanwhile, on the Fort Mercer, which looks like it's going to go down at any second, there's, I think there was, uh, this is off the top of my head, I think there was eight men left after the one had been swept away. And finally, a Coast Guard cutter arrives, the Yucutat, and they send over a raft, and men jump, and they land in the water. They're immediately so hypothermic, they can't manipulate their hands, so they can't get into the raft. You know, they went up to it, is what the men on the Coast Guard ship said, who I interviewed, and they said they were clutching and clutching, and they just couldn't hold on and four of them were swept away. So you have five fatalities and the rescue hasn't even started yet. So that's, that's how difficult this was because of the temperatures. So then they sent out a, a small vessel from the ship. It was about 22 feet 
and the, the beauty of doing the book was the research. I would, the internet was a big help. I knew on this rescue boat was a gentleman by the name of Gil Carmichael, and I found him after calling every Carmichael in the country. Uh, and so he's the gentleman standing up, and he said, I was terrified. He said, this, this rescue had already gone into the second day, and he said the seas were down. They were up to 60 feet. He said, now they're down to maybe 20 feet. He said, but it was still just unbelievable uh, to be in this small boat. And he said, we made it over to the oil tanker. We told a couple guys who were left, I believe there was four left, to jump. Uh, two jumped, and Gil was able to get them, haul them into the boat, and then his little rescue boat hit the side of the oil tanker, fractured the wooden ribbing, and he's sinking now. And so Gil sent me this picture, and he said, here I am bringing the vessel back. And he said, you could see one of the survivors is here. There's his arm and his head. I said, well, what happened next? And he goes, I don't remember. I go, you remembered everything else. Why? He said, when we got up to the, the Coast Guard cutter, they lowered the block and tackle, and it was swinging in the wind. He said, hit me right in the head, knocked me out cold. And then he had this funny story. He said, so later, I wake up, and I'm in my bunk, and he goes to himself, I just had the most amazing dream <laughs> that I finally got to rescue two sailors. And he said he didn't realize it was real until he got out of his bunk and realized all his clothes were wet. They put him to bed with wet clothes. And he said, and I still didn't quite you know, process everything that had happened because I'd been hit in the head. And he said, but when I got up on the deck of the ship, it all came together and they said, yeah, Gil, you had almost made it back and you were knocked out cold. So he said, we couldn't use that rescue boat anymore because the wood was fractured. He said, so we sent a life raft over again, even though it didn't work well the first time. And I know it's hard for you to see, but what happened was two men jumped and they, they jumped and landed inside and you've got one line going to the raft from the Coast Guard cutter, another line going this way, and it's, it's you know, stuck in between the two lines. Well, the men who were inside, again, they were so hypothermic from being on the tanker for so long, they couldn't untie the line going towards the tanker. So now they're stuck. And I found a guy named Bill Bleakley. He said, I was on the bridge with the captain. And the captain muttered something like, now what? And Bill said, Captain, you have no choice but to back down. In other words, put it in reverse and hope that the line snaps on the side towards the oil tanker. And then we could pull them in. And he said, so when we put it in reverse, the tension on the line forced the raft to go up in the air with these two guys hanging on for dear life. And he said, boom, the line snapped on the side towards the oil tanker, and he said, we were able to haul them in. And so one of them is still in there, and you can see he's just frozen stiff. Uh, he couldn't even move, so Coasties had to go down the scramble net to get him. And Bill said that the next thing was really odd. He said, you know, we're focused on the survivors, and then somebody shouts, look, look. And he's pointing back towards the oil tanker. And the whole thing, here's that last guy being taken off. The whole thing just goes up in the air. This is an amazing shot. So, you know, what little is left of the bottom is down here. It just rose up suddenly. And I thought, okay, now it's going to flop over. And Bill said, no, it, it went down like a pile driver slowly. And he said the strange thing about it was we had just got these last two men off and they'd been on there now with it split in half for 24 hours and the thing sinks two minutes after they get off. He said, what are the odds that it would stay afloat? So, you know, luck plays a role in all these survival books that I, that I write. There's, there's no getting around it. So they were just lucky. And then this was the last picture taken before it disappears. 
Now the stern section was a little bit uh, a little bit more stable. So you, you could see it's not on that steep angle. You can see all the twisted metal broken off there. And so again, uh, they put out that SOS. A Coast Guard cutter called the East Wind heard it. And the gentleman standing in the far left next to the man with the beard was the radio operator. I did interview him. He said, I heard the SOS over our headsets during the storm. And he's wondering, even if we make it there, how are we going to get them off because we're an icebreaker? And I had no idea what an icebreaker was, so he, he educated me. I always thought if, you know, maybe the icebreaker uh, rams the ice to break it up. He said, no, 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 you slide the bow up on top of the ice and the weight of the ship breaks it. And I said, well, what if the ice is too thick? And the next day I get this picture from him. He said, we blow it up. <laughs> so, so he's going, so we're more equipped to do this kind of thing than a rescue. So he said, we were wondering just how effective we'd be when we arrive. So this is the east wind arriving at the Fort Mercer's uh, stern section. And again, none of this part of the story will be in the, the Disney movie. Uh, they're not going to focus on the Fort Mercer. So. I like to tell the story just because it's kind of like the untold story under the radar. <coughs> and they had to go to the old life raft uh, procedure again. They, they couldn't think of anything else. But one of the men, I guess it was Len, the radio operator, said a wave went under the raft. And it was so big it flipped the man up like a pancake. And luckily he came down in the raft. But the captain of the East Wind said, forget this raft business. We're going to kill these men. And at least they didn't have as that one man who jumped didn't have as far to jump. That's why he landed in the life raft rather than the water. Frozen solid. But they got them, you know, got them wrapped up there and they're bringing them below. And then a second Coast Guard cutter arrives in the background there, that's it. It's called the uh, Akushnet. And even though the, the east wind and the, the captain was the on-scene commander, he was smart enough to relinquish control to the Akushnet because they were more maneuverable. And that captain on the Akushnet was John Joseph. And he said, I'm going to try to pull up alongside this sinking ship and get the men to jump. So that's, that's John Joseph. And what they did was, you know, it was the second day, but the waves were still 25, 30 feet, and you'd have the, the oil tanker on the wave and then maybe the cushionet like this, but close to each other, almost like where my hands are, three feet apart. And the men on the sinking oil tanker didn't want to jump because, because of this motion. What if we miss? And so now... Talk about lucky breaks for a researcher. John Joseph had passed away. I, I did locate his, I think it was his son. And I said, did he tell you anything about it? And he goes, not really, but I have something better. I said, my father tried to sell an article about his experience to the Reader's Digest 40, 50 years ago. And they never published it, but I still have it. And I was like, yes, send that. <laughs> so it was like interviewing John Joseph. And in his little article, he said, the guys weren't jumping, so when we crossed near each other, I had a couple of my Coasties reach out and grab a guy. And, and he said, when we got him safely on board, the others started to jump. So maybe half the crew jumped until one man hit a patch of ice, went across the cutter's deck, over the other side, and he's hanging on the rail for dear life. They did save them, but John Joseph said no one else would jump after that. They realized, oh my God, this, you know, this ice and this waves. So they took their chance. And this picture was taken by one of the ones who did jump, and he's thanking John Joseph. And so it was all over the country. This is a 
big deal, one of these forgotten incidents, but back then it was the front page of newspapers across the country. And I really did sneak out on my lunch breaks and go to the Boston <laughs> Public Library. And I was like, okay, I'm not successful enough to retire from this corporate career, but I still want to rescue, I want to do this research. So I tried to pretend like I was going to a meeting all the time. <laughs> And I'd put, you know, files under my arm, and never, I never would put a coat on because that would tip people I'm leaving the building. So in the dead of winter, I'd be running to the Boston Public Library, and finally uh, somebody at the library said, can I ask, can you not afford a coat? <laughs> and I said, it's a long story what I'm doing, but I'm glad I did it in retrospect. And here's some of the survivors in borrowed clothing. Now, there were 13 men who decided not to jump off. And in this picture, one of them's waving. This is day two, uh, towards the end. And he's basically saying, we're OK. And it turned out to be the right move because the, the stern section never did sink. Um, it stayed afloat. It must have had separate compartments in the bulkheads below. And even, look, it even has power. You can see the smoke or the steam. And so they were able to stay afloat, and they actually got towed to Newport, Rhode Island. And a Coastie who had been doing the rescue told me, he said, so there I was. I just risked my life to save these guys. He said, now I happen to end up in Newport, Rhode Island, because I hitchhiked there from where the cutter pulled in. And he said, I look out and I see this half a tanker. And he said, that's the one I risked my life on. And then he sees all the media waiting to go and interview these uh, survivors, uh, thinking this is going to be the story of a lifetime. Get the eyewitnesses. You know, they'll be half dead. And he said, so I went with the media out to the oil tanker. And he said, they welcomed us with a bacon and eggs breakfast. <laughs> He said, because they had full power, they had heat, it, it turned out to be the right choice to stay with the ship. Whereas if you stayed with the other one, you saw what happened to that. So it's so hard to tell. But the one thing I've learned from doing these types of stories is you're always better off on the stern of a ship. So keep that in mind. If you're ever in trouble, move aft. It's, it's always the bow section that goes down first. So the Disney movie now will, will focus on the Pendleton. And they did not get off an SOS. So the way it was discovered was at the Coast Guard station in Chatham, they had some rudimentary radar, and they did pick up a blip. But they thought it was the piece of the Fort Mercer. And so they sent a plane out. And he got low, and he couldn't believe it. On the radio, he said, you're not going to believe this. It's a whole other tanker split in half. It's called the Pendleton. And so some of the filming for the movie was done here because today it looks pretty much the same as back in 1952. So the commander of the station, his name is Daniel Clough, he's first has to send out a crew to the, the bow of the Pendleton. And it's these four men. The one in the light colored hat is Donald Bangs. And they go out. It's really dangerous because this is happening the day of the storm where the waves were huge. Uh, they, they get out to the bow and only one man shows up. He's up, he's up in this area and he jumps. And they can't get them. It's just the waves are too big, and they lose them. Now night comes, and it, nobody else comes out. And instead of heading in, uh, I thought Donald Bangs did something heroic. We use the term too frequently now to just about everything. But he could have come back in and said he tried, and night's coming. You're out in 60-foot seas. He's in a, what, a 36-foot boat? Uh, he stayed out there all night circling it, hoping somebody else would come out. And so in the newspapers, he just got maybe a mention. But in the book, 
I really researched his background. We gave him a lot of press for what he tried to do, even though he was unsuccessful. And things have changed there off Monomoy and the, the beach and then the Chatham Coast Guard Station, but this is from that era. And the, the two parts of the, the tankers, the bow was here the, and the stern was up here. Bangs went around this way out of Stage Harbor and up, but the next boat that comes out comes down and has to cross the Chatham Bar. And the one in this second vessel was Bernie Weber. So in the, in the movie, he, he's the central character of the movie. And that's played by uh, Chris Pine. So Clough, the commanding officer, turns to Bernie and says, pick yourself a crew. You've got to go out to the stern. And Bernie told me, he said, I thought I was going on a suicide mission. That By now, he said, it's getting late in the day, so I know I'm going to be out there trying to get out in the dark. And he said, I didn't even want to pick the crew because it'd be like saying, you know, you, 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 come with me and die. He said, so I kind of hesitated. And he said, luckily, three men volunteered. And one of them didn't even work at the Coast Guard station. He was a light ship uh, sailor, but he happened to be stuck there. And I wondered why. Bernie accepted him, but I, and we never really talked about it, but looking back, I think he wanted volunteers so they were all in rather than to force somebody in. And he could have forced somebody in. So he took Irving Mask, even though he had very little experience. He took him because he, he wanted to give it a shot. So in this picture, there's Bernie on the left. Richard Livesey in the middle, who volunteered, and Andy Fitzgerald on the right. And I was able to interview all three. And they said that we left from the pier. And you know, you can be a, a hero, but it doesn't mean you're going to be unafraid. Uh, because they told me we were afraid. So much so, we started singing to calm our nerves. I'm like, singing? He said, yep. We sang Rock of Ages as we went out. Uh, because he, he said that we didn't think we'd make it beyond the bar. The bar's a shallow area it's where the big waves roll in. So here's where they left from. And they're in calm water heading out, but they can hear the giant 50-foot waves crashing on the bar. And this is the boat they were in, the 36500. So Bernie, he'd be standing, the wheel you stand up behind the windshield, and then his men would be scattered in, in different positions. They had a little searchlight, and he said no more than like a pipe-powered flashlight. And they said, we had to get over these breaking waves. So this was a painting done of them leaving. And here's the path they took. And unfortunately, there's no pictures of them crossing the bar because by now it's, it's night. But I asked the Coast Guard, send me a picture of a ship crossing a bar. And this is out at the Columbia River. So there, that's a 47-foot Coast Guard motor lifeboat that's got to get over the bar. And I showed this to Bernie, and he said, exactly. He said, that that's, was it. And in this case, it stands this Coast Guard vessel right up. And then the following, you see the tip of it coming out. And it didn't make it. It was rolled. All these Coasties survived only because they had the surf belts on clipped to the boat. So the boat is self-righting, and when it came up, they were still on it. I said to Bernie, you, you had your surf belt on, right? He goes, Mike, they hadn't even been invented. He goes, <laughs> he said, we were in, he said, to give you an idea, the clothes were in, you know, we're in a cotton coat, and the, the boots we had on were like the kind you would wear as a kid, the big black boots with the big buckles. 
And he said, those were just filled with water. And I said, did, did the wave hit you like this? He said, yes, but it didn't roll us. He said, it hit us and broke the windshield because we're kind of going into this breaking wave. And he said, the water poured through and it swept the compass away. And so up, you know, up to this point, I always thought, OK, I don't consider these men heroes because they're just doing their job. They're getting paid to do this. And at this point, the smart thing for self-preservation would have been to turn back. You have no compass. You, you have no windshields. Uh, but Bernie had been in an unsuccessful rescue a year earlier. And although he never said this, I really think that played heavily on his mind. He, men died because he couldn't do the rescue. It wasn't his fault, but they just couldn't pull it off. So rather than heading in and saying, we lost our compass, our windshield's gone, he decided to give it a, a second shot. And it, Andy told me on the second time, he said, instead of trying to get over this breaking wave, he said, Bernie gave it full throttle. And he said, we kind of went through it like a submarine almost. And he said, we made it. We came out the other side. We were all wet. Uh, and we were holding on for dear life. But we came out the other side. And then Andy said, so I'm thinking, well, now what? We don't have a compass to go to the position where the sinking boat was spotted. And Bernie said, we just kind of searched around. And then Bernie said, this, this is what I'll always remember in my conversations with him. And I'll tell you later, in the beginning, he wasn't too keen to write this book. But he said, if you do this book, put in what I think happened next. And I think I was somehow guided by a higher power. He said, all the things that happen after this don't make sense. He said, because we found the oil tanker uh, just by groping around in the dark. And this painting is very accurate. Bernie worked with the artist. And when they arrived, there were men up coming up on the deck, and then down came a Jacob's Ladder, and they wanted off this ship in the worst way. And what Bernie had to do was go in like they are here, get close to whoever the man was, get that one man on, and then get out of there before the next wave pushed them into the vessel. Mm -hmm. So they're doing this over and over, timing it. And everything's going uh, good until he gets to the 15th man. He's realized he's exceeded the capacity of the lifeboat. You know, it's riding low in the water, and you don't want that with waves so big. And he, he had to make a decision. I said, did you talk with Andy? Because Andy's the engineer. He knows the vessel inside and out. Bernie said, Mike, you couldn't talk. He said, the wind was just shrieking. He said, I just made a split decision. It was going to be all or nothing. So he said, I kept going in. What he didn't know is there was a grand total of 33 men on this part of the ship. And he's at number 15 thinking, we're riding so low, we're in trouble. He gets to the 32nd man, and it was this big guy, like an NFL you know, lineman, over 300 pounds. And his nickname was Tiny Myers. He comes, <laughs> Tiny comes down the ladder, you know, and he jumps to the Bernie's little uh, rescue boat, misses. And Richard and Andy told me, we had him. He's in the water. He said, we had him. He had a life jacket on, I believe. He said, but he was too big. We couldn't pull him in. And the, the problem was, you know how th this would be similar to the situation, except it was on this side of the vessel. And then a big wave came in, slammed the vessel into the hull, and crushed Tiny Myers. And then he was gone. And Bernie, again, had a split decision. Do we look for Tiny Myers, or do we get the last guy who's hanging on the ladder screaming? And he said, I had to make a split decision. I think Tiny had died. We hit so hard, and we couldn't see him. He said, I had to get that last guy. So now he's got 32 men plus the crew is 36 men on a 36-foot boat. 
which is just mind-blowing how you would be crammed in there. And he said again, no compass. I wasn't sure which way to go. He said, I just followed the waves and I shouted to the few men who could hear me. If I say jump means we hit a shoal, we might be near Monomoy, go with the waves, you might wash up on the island. So he didn't have a lot of confidence that they'd make it back alive. But they did. And he said, I don't know how we got back. He said, a, a wave picked us up, put us over the bar, and he said, all of a sudden we were in, you know, just eight foot seas. And I said, you didn't even know you were at the bar? He said, no. He, just, he said it was miraculous. He said, I can't explain it. Because uh, all sorts of bad things could have happened. And he said, we went over, the wave deposited us, everybody was still on board, and then here they are returning. And so the whole town is out, because again, this is being broadcast live on the radio, others are listening to the marine radios. And the people in the town think, oh, what a shame, they only brought back one guy. <laughs> and the, the thing is, the rescue boat has a hatch, all the others were crammed underneath. So like a clown car in a parade, <laughs> when the hatch comes out, all these guys start pouring out. And here they are. Some of these life jackets are so old, they, they have the cork inside with the canvas over it. And the people in the town are putting them in their cars to warm them up, taking them to the station. This is my favorite picture. It's everybody's left but the cameraman. And that's Bernie up high, Irving Mask below. And you, you can kind of see in Bernie that He's still trying to process all this. You know, he's just the relief that we're, we did it. We're alive. And then back at the station now, everybody's there. The media's there. So they're having these guys kind of pose, uh, the four rescuers. And it's going out over the AP across the country. Miracle rescue, miracle rescue. But they're also interviewing survivors. Um, there's one frozen guy in the chair there, another one's collapsed, he's on the ground. But you could see in the background cameramen. And this is all at Chatham Station. We interviewed, uh, I think his name was Ed Semprini, who was uh, doing this live radio broadcast. Um, he lived at the Cape and was able to get through the snowstorm and make it there. And then the four rescuers now, the AP is putting it out over the country, and they're being called America's heroes. And it was fascinating. You know, like Andy said, oh, I had my 15 minutes of fame. Uh, Bernie's reaction was the opposite. He said it was awful to be labeled a hero. I'm like, why? He said, Mike, it was just a burden. He said, I was making the Coast Guard my career, and he said, you know, I was being transferred from station to station. And he said, I think there was jealousy. And he said, rightfully so, because maybe these other men had done rescues just as dangerous as mine. But because mine got all the attention, I'm known as the Coast Guard's greatest hero. And he said, I was totally uncomfortable with that. But to show what he was made of, here's a great leadership lesson. The, the Coast Guard says to Bernie, what you did is amazing. And they want to, they said, we're going to give you the gold life-saving medal, the highest medal you can get. And he said, we're going to give your crew the silver. And Bernie said, keep your medals. And they're like, this is the top brass of the Coast Guard. And they're like, what are you talking about? And Bernie said, if you don't give them the gold, I won't accept it. Because he said, I didn't do this rescue on my own. Without these three volunteers, none of this would have happened. And it was amazing. The Coast Guard brass backed down and gave all four of them the gold life-saving medal. And it, it was just a beautiful way of him deflecting the attention all on him to say, these guys did just as much. And Bernie said, another of the hard parts was now I'm like <laughs> the Coast Guard poster boy, so they had me going to speak at Rotaries and everything else. And he said, I was very uncomfortable doing that because they would introduce me 
as this big hero, and he said, I firmly believe that what happened was I was guided by some higher power. He said, because I just kind of got lucky, and there's no explanation for it. So there was, you know, we, we talked about the, the hulk of the ship stayed out on this shoal. This is it. You could still see the Jacob's ladder coming down. And Bertie believes that after he got that last man off, he thinks shortly thereafter the, the section went on its side. And I said, how, well, how would you know in the dark? He said, I don't know for sure. He said, but all of a sudden you heard this groaning and splitting of metal. And he said, I think a way finally put it over. <coughs> so salvagers would go off there. Uh, one person contacted me, said, I have the wheel of the Pendleton. I'm like, well, I could like to see that. And, you know, they would pick over the good stuff. And then remember the bow section, what, one man jumped and nobody else came out. And Donald Bangs went around it. Well, I'm reading in a Coast Guard casualty report, and it said, three days later, we sent out Mel Guthro to search the Pendleton's bow for bodies. So I see the name Mel Guthro, and I start calling Guthros around the country. <laughs> Turns out, Mel Guthro lived a mile from my house. It was just like, whoa. And I go, do you re recall what you did? And he goes, oh yeah, come over, I took pictures. So these are Mel's pictures, and he said, you could see the sea is flat ass calm, and he said, I was still afraid because the tanker was groaning with the metal. It was on a, on a shoal. And he said, so we pulled up, there's the bridge, partially submerged, and I got off, went inside expecting, we knew that the captain was on this section, uh, we knew there were five others. He said, we thought we'd find their bodies here in the bridge. He said, empty. And he said, the hard part is now, he said, I had to go down through the bowels of the ship with a flashlight searching for bodies. And he said, there was nothing until he got to the very tip. And he said, we called it, I called it the, the paint room because some paint was stored there. And he said, under a bunch of burlap bags was one man frozen solid. And I said, well, what about the captain and the others? He said, not a trace. So this will be the mystery that'll never be solved because their bodies were never found. Um, Mel said anything could have happened to them. He said they could have been swept off the catwalk. You could see that's been bent. He said the, there was a little lifeboat on board. That was gone. Maybe they got into that and, and went over. He said it could be anything, and he said, you there's, you know, it'll never be solved because even though the captain's wife, you know, would go down and walk the seashore off Chatham every day, no one ever found a trace. And then on the, the good news front, the boat that Bernie used was found in decay out behind a garage from the National Seashore, and Bill Quinn who lived down in Orleans recognized it and then got volunteers together to fix it up. So now it's listed as a, a national historic site. And then overlooking the Chatham Bar, if you go near the Coast Guard Station, is the propeller from the original boat that Bernie put out. And I'll close with one last story. Bernie, uh, Helped, you know, he proofread the book and everything, and he sent me this email, and it goes, if um, you and Casey have the chance, go down to the rescue boat and give it a kiss, because I won't be able to do that. And I wrote him back, sure you will. Uh, we're going to get together in two weeks. We'll go down to the rescue boat together. And he was in perfect health. How he knew uh, he passed away that night, uh, just like that. Um, and then they had this beautiful memorial service for him in Orleans. And his grandkids were there, so I was talking to them after. And I said, did you know he was the greatest hero in Coast Guard history? And they said, yes. I said, do you know what he did? And they said, no. And I was like, why? And they said, he wouldn't talk about it. 
He said, all we knew was he was this big hero. And it was so nice to be able to hand them the book because it had just came out. But Bernie never had the chance to, to hold it in his hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And questions or, or comments? Mm -hmm. Did they ever find the first part of the ship that you showed? Oh, oh, the one that reared up in the air and then went down? It's a great question. They, it never totally, it was kind of like underneath the waves just a little bit. And Bill Bleakley said we had to actually blast it to get it to sink because it was a hazard to navigation. So he said we brought out these big guns and <laughs> started shooting it. So it, that finally did go down. Yes? Was there a design flaw that caused them to break in half? A great question. These were called T2 tankers, and both ships were the same size. They were both 500 feet. Built during World War II, and studying U-boats, I realized why they built them so quickly, because the U-boats were sinking, so many of our ships. So they were built in haste, and instead of, in some cases, having the rivets, they'd have welding. The metal was inferior. I read in one account where it would get brittle in cold weather. Well, this was cold. Uh, and then I, this was funny. I read some of these ships came with something called a crack arrestor. So never go on a ship that has a crack arrestor, because that means they're prone to cracking, and they're, they're having this band go over it to keep it together. So there was a, a flaw both in the metal and the lack of, of riveting. But, you, but it was because of the World War II effort. Just crank out as many ships as we could. Yes? Was that the Kaiser? Uh, yes. It was the Kaiser company that, yeah. that put these out. Yep. Was there? Yes. I, I remember in the 70s going to the Cape and going down Monomoy and seeing the Pendleton. Is it still there? No, that the blizzard of 78 put it into pieces. So, yeah, a lot of people have memories of seeing it or it going on it. You could crawl on it. Yeah, no, it's, it's in big pieces down, <coughs> down below. What they did for the movie, though, was in... Uh, the, the studio that they made in Quincy, they had this giant warehouse at the Four River Shipyard. They recreated half an oil tanker. It was unbelievable. You know, 200 feet up, and it had everything was exactly the specification, even down to rust on the knobs and the hatches. Yes? How much were you involved in the filming this fall? <laughs> Very little. Um, <laughs> it is a funny story. I'm probably the only author who tries out an audition for his own book and gets rejected. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's hard to memorize lines when it's not the way you would speak. So, you know, getting up and doing this is easy because I'm using, you know, the lines I would choose, but trying to memorize somebody else's. So they politely said, oh, you'll, you'll be an extra in the back. <laughs> Just to put some of this in perspective, I was stationed out in that area. I spent two years at Woods Hole, which abuts the Chatham uh, Bar. And they still had a 36-footer in operation when I went there in 1971. And if you think about digging a hole, a 36-footer is a shovel. And the 44-footer that replaced it is a bulldozer. Mm. How Senior Chief Weber was able to do what yeah. he did with a single screw, open boat, and 60-foot right. seas that was never meant to be in anything bigger than 20 feet, Right. Bring back that many people and everybody survived. To this day, I still can't figure it out because in the 44 footers, that would have been a difficult thing to do. And now the 44s are gone and the 47s are in and they're, they're even more capable. So I don't know how these men you know, you're so did right. what they did. Because people you know. have tried to put 36 people on that boat yeah. and they're like, there's no way. And it just, yeah, how Bernie did it without a compass. Yeah, yeah, maybe he's right. You know, it is a it is a miracle. Yes. Was there much oil in these ships? And related to that, was there if there was was there an environmental impact? It was really interesting. Both were filled. They were coming up here from Louisiana to bring home heating oil, and so that went all over the place. 
but it got one line in the Boston Globe because nobody cared about the environment back then. It was amazing. In fact, some Coast Guard ships in the early days would spread oil to calm the seas. So, you know, our thinking is so different today. Yes. How did the movie come about? Did you have to mark the story? Or did no. Did Disney I, find you one day and call you? <laughs> for, for years with all my books, I always thought 10 hours until dawn, that's the rescue during the blizzard of 78, would make a great movie. So I would just ship them out to different people in Hollywood, you know, and I'd never hear a thing. And this came about because a local producer named Dorothy Afiero read the book. And she approached Casey and I and said, will you let me pitch it to the two screenwriters who did the movie The Fighter, about the fighter up in Lowell? Mm -hmm. And then we will, as a team, do the screenplay. And she said, then we'll pitch it to studios. And of course, we said yes. We didn't, you know, we didn't know how to do it. So thank God Dorothy read it and saw the potential because Everything was from her efforts, uh, right through to the filming. Just an amazing uh, woman who lives right here outside of uh, Boston. The movie and everything talks about this incredible rescue. He says, but when I really think about it, he says, all I can see is Tiny Meyer's face in the water and us hanging on to him and that we couldn't get him. And it, it's very interesting. So he doesn't view it as this, this huge success. The nice thing is Andy is the, the last living rescuer and Disney did consult with him and they pushed up the date of the movie to October. So hopefully Andy will be the first person at the premiere um, because he was, he was the one who pulled it off. Yes? How far offshore were they? Uh, the, the rescue of the Pendleton wasn't far off at all. I'm talking maybe a mile, three quarters of a mile, whereas the Fort Mercer was way out there, and that's why that one had so much loss of life. Uh, just very hard to, to even get to. Well, I hope you take a look at the books. I'd be happy to sign them. So you have some serious topics. And then you have the lighter side of the porcupine and the cringe chronicles. Thank you very much. Thank you.